it's, we have to just kind of accept it by faith. We believe that no matter what we've done in the past, that God is able to restore and is restoring, even though we don't see that. We believe that God will fulfill his promises, even though we don't see them fulfilled. We believe that God is still in that God is still in control, even though we see terrible things happening every single day on the news, between school shootings and threat, threats of nuclear war, and I mean everything, everywhere you turn, you, you see bad things happening. Yet we still believe in faith that God is still in control, even though we see a bunch of chaos around us in our personal life and global news and all kinds of different things like that. So faith is, is the decision to believe in what you cannot see. And I specifically say decision because faith is not a feeling. Faith is basically making up your mind about a fact that isn't a fact yet. <laughs> but it's not just something that you pick and choose. It's something that God promises. You know what I mean? Like, for instance, I, just, I can't simply say, I will be rich one day and, and have faith and, and trust that that's going to happen. And, and actually, you know what I mean? Because faith isn't just naming whatever I want and then claiming that to be a reality. Faith is looking into what God has for the future and putting all your faith, all your trust in that thing. And no matter what you feel, holding on to that. Faith is a daily battle, however, and our emotions can destroy our faith. Reading God's word, prayer, these things help, but ultimately... We have to control our emotions because our emotions will destroy our faith. If we start looking at the problems, if we start looking at how terrible we feel, if we start looking at how we don't really feel up to it today or whatever, it'll become another day and then another day after that until finally you're in, a, you're in a stretch of just not really being into it. And you get in an attitude of complaining and bitterness and it seems like there's a circle that, that you'll just never break through. And oftentimes you don't even see that this is happening. Oftentimes, you think that it's everybody else's fault. You know, if they just get their act together or if, you know, things would just work out, if God would finally just hear my prayer and answer it. I've been praying for year after year. You see what I mean? And these things all distract our faith. And so, really, our emotions are one of the greatest deterrents to faith. Faith is a process, though. We aren't there yet. It's a daily process. It's something that we're always working towards but never seem to have attained. You know what I mean? Like, I know one day, you know, we'll be in heaven with God. And, and like Paul says in 1 Corinthians, faith, hope, and love, and the grace of these is love. You see, because faith will one day be done away with. What will there be to have faith in in heaven? We'll be in the fulfillment of the promise. There'll be nothing more to have faith in. Hope is the expectation of something. You can't expect anymore when the reality is already there. But love, love on the other hand, will continue forever. And it's really that frail nature of faith that I think puts it all into perspective. That, you know, our lives are so short. And even beyond the scope of our lives, faith really ends at death. You know, and, and we have all these struggles that we go through and all these things that in our heads seem like well-reasoned ideas as to why we have an excuse to not choose to believe and obey God. But the reality is, there is no reason to not believe and obey God. When you hear his word, you listen to it because we know that he is faithful. Faith must be met with endurance, though. If I have faith today, and tomorrow I abandon the faith, my faith is worth nothing. Faith is only really measured by how well it endures through the tests. Mm -hmm. Let's say today I have enough faith that I heal every single sick person in the entire Tularosa Basin. They all come to me, I heal all of them. And then, if that's not enough, I then speak to the ground and out of the ground comes a lake and there is forever a lake around Tularosa. Mm -hmm. And then, the very next day I say, God, I don't believe in you anymore, I just abandon the faith. What good would that faith have done? Do you know what I mean? Doesn't the prophet Ezekiel say that if a righteous person turns, their righteousness will not be remembered? 
we won't be remembered for the things that we do in the past. We'll, we'll be remembered by God for the things that we are, the choices that we make now. And faith is really only of benefit to anything if it is met with endurance. It's the decision that I will stay the course, regardless of how I feel, regardless of what appears to be a failure all around me, it's the decision that through it all, I'm going to stay the course. Faith is not pride in yourself. I will stay the course. Faith is, is pride in God's promise. Because of who he is, I will stay the course. It's a steady resolve and humility made because you realize how great God is. You know, if you go outside and pick up a pebble, that pebble's not very big, is it? But you know what happens if you hold that pebble in front of your eye? You won't even be able to see the mountains because you've got that pebble so close in front of your eyes. That's a good analogy for what it's like with faith. See, God is all-powerful. He's that big mountain over there. But see, we are masters of picking up pebbles and making them seem like mountains, but the truth is we're just looking real hard at nothing. And that's, in essence, what wrecks our faith. Faith is deciding to put down the pebble and look to the mountain. So in Ruth chapter 1, verses 1-7, through 7, it says, Now it came about in the days when the judges governed that there was a famine in the land, and a certain man of Bethlehem and Judah went to sojourn in the land of Moab with his wife and his two sons. Now we looked at this uh, when, last time when we talked about Naomi, so I'm just going to go right through it pretty fast. The name of the, of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife, Naomi. And the names of his two sons were Malon and Kilian, uh, Ephrathites of Bethlehem and Judah. Now they entered the land of Moab and remained there. And then Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left with her two sons. They took for themselves Moabite women as wives. The names of the one, the name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other Ruth. And they lived there about ten years. So just to kind of put things into perspective, okay? These are Israelites. They were given a promise, so they had to go live in, in Israel. But they weren't listening to God, so God was bringing by things to cause them to turn to Him. Bad situations. Situations that they couldn't just run away from. Situations that they had to humble themselves before God. And it said, Judges says that as they did call out to God, he did hear them. But what we have here is we have Israelites just abandoning the promise going to Moab, who is not part of the promise. Abandoning what God had for them for what they saw as a more prosperous way. And then another big thing about the law is you really aren't supposed to inter intermingle with, you know, that means to marry with the people who are not Israelites. You aren't supposed to go out to Moab and all the other Canaanite areas and say, hey, will you be my wife? That's one of the main things that God says a hundred times throughout the law. Don't marry them because your hearts will stray to their gods. So here we have this man abandoning his promise in Israel, going to Moab, and his kids are marrying people who they were commanded not to marry. So we just have an all-around cluster cuss of what's going on here. Then both Malon and Kilian also died, and the woman, woman was bereft of her two children and her husband. Then she rose with her two daughters-in-law, that she might return from the land of Moab, for she had heard in the land of Moab that the Lord had visited his people and giving them food. Obviously she didn't see it because she wasn't in the promised land. So she departed from the place where she was and her two daughters-in-law with her, and they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. Now over the course of time here, uh, throughout the story here, Naomi tells her two daughter-in-laws, go back. Don't, there, there's nothing that can be profited you by coming with me. You know, this is your home, this is your family, you just stay here. Because I'm not with child, and even if I was able to go get a husband, would you wait around while I wait to conceive and then bear this child to you, and then you have to wait another 20 years to marry this child? You know, like, it's just not probable. Just go back to your homeland. You go do your thing, and I'll go to my homeland. And, uh, you know, they're, they're women, so they cry about it. Just a joke. Just a joke. Everybody's looking at me like... I'm going to cry. <laughs> so Orpah cries and goes, and Naomi cries and stays. Verses 14 through 18. And they lifted up their voices and wept again. And Orpah... Yes, again. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. Then she said, Behold, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, Do not urge me to leave you or to turn back from following you, for where you go, I will go, and where you lodge, I will lodge. 
Your people shall be my people, and your God my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. Thus may the Lord do to me, and worse if anything but death parts you and me. So I could have misunderstood, but I think she just said that where you die, I'm just going to hang around there. And then when I die, I'm just going to be thrown around there. Yeah. Verse 18, when she saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more to her. How did Naomi see that Ruth was determined to go with her? She declared it. Naomi said, okay, you go back. And what did Ruth say? No. Your God will be my God. I'm abandoning this. I'm going with you. End of conversation. The, she didn't argue with her. The, her. She had her mind made up what she was going to do. So what did Naomi do? Well, I can't argue with you. <laughs> You've obviously made up your mind. Absolutely. Absolutely. Ruth left her home, her family, her gods, which was a big part back then. See, nowadays it might not... Might not be as big of an issue, but okay. Here's a, here's an excellent excellent example. In Native American culture, um, you know the ancestor worship and that kind of stuff is a big part of their culture. That's exactly how it was for all of these people. These gods were not just gods; they were important parts of their family history, important parts of their uh, everything that made them them. And so when she gave up her gods to follow Naomi's god, this was a big thing. She was giving up her identity. That's a big thing to say. So she left her home, her family, her gods, her comfort, without guarantee of anything. Ruth left all that without a promise or even a likelihood that something would come in place of that. She gave it all up, knowing that she might never get anything in return. Naomi didn't ask her to do it either. You have Ruth making a very illogical decision. And it's not based off of feelings either. You can tell that by the whole event that's happened. Orpah's already gone back. I should go back with her. You know, why not? That's where my family is and everything. That's an emotional decision. Go back where I'll be happy and comfortable. That's an emotional decision. But that's not the decision Ruth made. So she didn't make... A decision based off of logic or emotion. So, what did she... Faith. Ruth made a decision based off of faith. Ruth saw not what was, but she saw what God might do in the future. And even if it didn't happen, the maybe was good enough. The maybe was good enough. She, tra uh, she traded what she had for what she maybe could have. She saw past her pain, past her loss, past her regret, and past her discouragement into what maybe could happen. Maybe. So the first thing on the slide there is that faith must be met with endurance. Faith must be something that you set in your heart to do past comfort and past what makes logical sense. But here we also have the second thing. Faith is always met with action. That second point on the slide there, Ben. Faith is always met with action. What good does it profit you if you say you have faith, but you don't do anything about it? This is exactly what James said. Your faith is dead. See, we don't do works to be saved. I'm not talking about that. But I'm talking about genuine faith, which produces works. I know that God will do what he said he's going to do. So I'm not going to stray from the chorus. I'm going to dig my hills in, and I'm going to keep moving ahead. I will not stray from the chorus because I know who God is, and I know what he promised. Faith is met with action. You see, Ruth was not an Israelite. She had no claim to the promise that she was hoping for. She had no claim to the promise that she was hoping for. But she still gave it all up for the hope of that promise. Though it was not owed to her. God never said, 
anything to the Moabites, he made a promise to the Israelites. She had nothing. But see, the thing about Ruth is, she realized that she didn't have anything anyways. If she would have stayed in Moab with her family and with her gods, what would it have profited her? Nothing. She could have lived her whole life in comfort, probably gotten remarried, gotten, gotten many, many kids and grandkids, and been perfectly happy over there in Moab. But it wouldn't have profited her anything. We see this exact same example happen with Moses, who traded all that he had in Egypt, even though he was, he was well off in Egypt. There was no logical reason for Moses to leave too. But he left that all behind and headed out to the desert. See what I mean? That, that can just only be attributed to faith. When you realize that all the wealth in the world profits you absolutely nothing. So if you'll flip over to, to Ruth chapter 3. Now, we looked at a lot of this other stuff last week. I'm sorry, not last week. A couple weeks ago when I talked about Naomi. And we'll look at the rest of the stuff that's going on when we look at Boaz next week. But right now we're just going to uh, switch down to chapter 3, <clears throat> verses 1 through 7. Then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, My daughter, shall I not seek security for you, that it may be well with you? Now is not Boaz our kinsman, with whose maids you were? Behold, he winnows barley at the threshing floor tonight. Wash yourself tonight, and anoint yourself, and put on your best clothes, and go down to the threshing floor. But do not make yourself known to the man until he has finished eating and drinking. It shall be when he lies down. You sh Do you guys know what hangry means? <laughs> hangry is where you haven't had anything to eat after a long day's work, and you start getting very, very angry. And it's an irrational anger that is not reconciled until you give the monster some food. Right. <laughs> Cookie Monster. Think Cookie Monster. That's a perfect example. It shall be when he lies down that you shall notice the place where he lies. And you shall go and uncover his feet and lie down. Then he will tell you what you shall do. She said to her, All that you say I will do. So she went down to the threshing floor and did according to all that her mother-in-law had commanded her. When Boaz had eaten and drunk, and his heart was merry, he went, see, he was no longer hangry. He went to lie down at the end of the heap of grain, and she came secretly and uncovered his feet and lay down. Okay, so you just have a lot of things going on here. Ruth and Naomi get back to the promised land. They get back to, to the land that is Naomi's. But they don't really have anything going on. You know, they don't really have any money. They don't really have anything to do. So Ruth, in character with her character, she's always asking things. She's just, a, and we're going to look at this more next week, but really just a great example of, 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 of sticking, through, sticking through to the good thing. Uh, anyways, she starts working in this field that turns out to be Boaz's field, and Boaz is what's called her kinsman redeemer. Now, what a kinsman redeemer is, is if you're married... And your spouse dies, this only applies to the women. If you're married and your husband dies, you would marry the next closest relative. And then wh whatever children that that relative produced for you would count as the dead person's child and not yours. Okay, so I'm married to Gracie. I die. Let's say Chuck's my uh, next... Let me think. Next youngest brother. So Chuck goes and marries her, and then he has a, has a child with Gracie. That child would not be considered Chuck's child. It would be considered my child. Does that make sense? That's the idea of a kinsman redeemer. And so Boaz is her kinsman redeemer. Um, it, not, not close. They're, it's not brothers. She, he's separated by a, by, a few, by a few parents. <laughs> it doesn't really specify how far they're separated. But uh, relatively close uh, uh, redeemer. Anyways, um, so here we have a lot of stuff. I'm going to try and break it down. Okay, first off, uh, the next point on the slide there, there Benny, faith requires risk. We like to play things safe. We like to not take any chances. And what Ruth had to do here was very risky. She had a comfortable little setting, okay? She was getting her food. They had some place to live. It was good enough for now. Let's just keep it here, right? And Naomi says here in the beginning of chapter 3, shouldn't I be concerned for your future well-being? So this is what you should do. You should go and, and, and do this. 
And I'll explain why this is her, her solution to the problem. But so Ruth goes and does this like Naomi tells her to, even though this is a huge risk. You know, I'm getting ahead of myself, so I'm trying to kind of explain as I go. Okay. First off, a redeemer was supposed to come forward on their own. But no redeemer had come forward for Ruth. And it had been at least the entire season. Because it mentions that she stayed there till the end of that harvest. So this was a substantial, substantial amount of time and no kinsman redeemer had come forward. So there's the risk of, do they not want me? Is there an issue because I'm a Moabite and they're Israelites? What's going on? In fact, later on in the story, we see that they hadn't even thought about, the kinsman redeemers hadn't even thought about this. So, oh, hold on, okay, we're, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to explain as I go here. So no redeemer had come, come forward. Ruth was taking a huge risk in going forward to the kinsman redeemer. First off, it's just not that great for women back then to be that much that forward. Second off, it risks jeopardizing everything because she was getting a good source of food from Boaz. And if she made him mad, she would lose that good source of, uh, of food. <laughs> See what I mean? Everything was at stake with this. It, it, this was really a, a, a winner take. It was take all or lose and go home. Uh, really uh, limited options here. Um, but... I don't want to say all this stuff yet. Um, well, I want to explain it first, and, and these are all points about, but I have to explain it first. Um, okay. So in the in the threshing floor, where the threshing floor was, it was, it was a big big area where in the evenings they would take their grain and they would they would sift it like this, and, and the 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 waste stuff would fall off, and what they'd be left with was the stuff that they could actually use. Um, the, the stuff that blew away was called um, chef, I think it was what it was called. Uh, and the rest of it was, that was the meaty stuff they actually used, okay? But everybody shared a threshing floor. So you had to sleep there with your grain so that it wouldn't get stolen. So everybody has their own pile of grain, and you're just sleeping there. Not really the best arrangement I, that I can think of, but it's better than having to build yourself an individual, you know, uh, threshing floor for every person. I mean, that just seems like a huge waste of space. Um, so, so here we have that. Now she goes to him at night. Now, first off, if you notice, she made herself seem as pleasant as possible. She washed up, put on some makeup. She then did, she then did her hair right. She put on some good clothes. She made herself look as pleasant as possible. Next, she also went at the most con convenient time. A, there wasn't an audience. Which Boaz was a, was a working man. It was very hard to get around him when there was no audience. B, at night, so that you don't you know he doesn't have other obligations. And then she waits until after he eats and drinks, so he's all kinds of happy. Now, if you wanted to ask something that could jeopardize your entire well-being, don't you think that you would do it at the most likely opportunity that they'd say yes? yes. Kind of try to maybe fool them into saying yes. Jeez. That's what we have here. Naomi's like, okay. I have this idea. See, nobody's come forward for you. Maybe they just see us as lost causes. But we might be able to fool them into doing their responsibility. See, if you go to him at night, after he's already happy, and you make yourself look really attractive, we might be able to win this one over. See, why did they have to resort to that? Because the redeemers didn't come forward for Ruth or Naomi. They just abandoned them. They were widows, and they abandoned them. So they had to resort to desperate measures to see some sort of a blessing or, 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 or well-being in the, in the long run. See, what Naomi is saying here at the beginning of chapter 3 is, we're fine now, but we don't know how, well, how long this is going to last. So this is really our last-ditch effort to make sure that we're in a secure environment. You need to go to Boaz, and you need to make yourself as attractive as possible, make sure he's in good spirits, nice and drunk, make sure that everything is in your favor, because obviously, if he wanted us, he would have come and get us by, gotten us by now. See what I mean? This, is, this isn't the American culture. This is a long time ago, and, and women just didn't have the rights that they do now. And you have this whole thing that's going on here. So with all that being said, 
Ruth went all in. Even though she, she could have just tried and stayed where she was at. No, Naomi, that's a stupid idea. She listened to Naomi anyways, and she plunged into, into receiving the promise. What else does she have to lose? She already gave up her own land, <laughs> right? So then, um, <clears throat> but God will always give in response to a sacrifice. If When we sacrifice a little, God will respond a little. When we sacrifice all, God will respond in great ways. When we try and follow God while still holding in on to parts of ourselves, God will bless us, yeah, absolutely. But we'll miss so much more that God had for us. But when we go all in, Lord, you can have my finances, you can have my time, you can have my family, you can have all, all of me. That is just begging for God to heap blessings on you. And you know what? I've never seen God forsake the righteous. That's exactly what Psalm says. I was young. Now I'm old, but I've never seen the righteous forsaken. And that's a promise that we can each stand on every generation. Well, I knew this one guy. God is not a liar. Keep on waiting. Keep on holding on in faith. And you will receive, a, you will receive an answer. God doesn't leave people hanging. God is not a fisherman who goes out onto the lake and casts out his line, catches a fish, and then just reels it just enough to keep it on the line. He doesn't do that. See what I mean? God, God's not just waiting for who he can pick on next. You know what I mean? God, is, God answers those people who are distressed. And these are, these are widows. You see what I mean? If you don't know anything about the Bible, let me clue you in here. God has a special heart for widows. And when people are abandoned and trodden in society, God will go out of his way to bless them. So Ruth may have been throwing everything in this last-ditch effort, but she wasn't just throwing it into the wind. She was trusting God for something greater. But in order to see something greater, you have to take a risk. Either you abandon your, 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 well, your will to, to God, or you don't receive any promise. Revelation shows us that God doesn't desire lukewarm people. He desires people whose hearts are set on him. So God responds to our sacrifice. When we sacrifice little, he responds little. When we sacrifice a lot, he responds a lot. Verses 3 through 5, and five I specifically want to focus in on. Wash yourself, therefore, and anoint yourself. Go through this whole thing. And she goes through this whole thing of what she should do. And then in verse 5, uh, she, Ruth says... She said to her, all that you say I will do. With faith, do what you know to do. Do what you know to do. People always look for a hidden will of God. Do what you know to do. Well, oh God, I'm, I'm waiting for this shining light from above experience. Do what you know to do. Well, there's an orphan that, you know, has been abandoned should I help the orphan? Nah, let's wait and let's wait and pray about it. Well, there's people in Houston who've undergone drastic flooding. They've lost their homes and most of their possessions. Should I should I help them? You don't have to pray about these things. Do what you know is right. But listen to godly advice for things you don't know what to do. Ruth didn't know what to do. She wasn't an Israelite. She didn't know the Israelite law. She didn't know what all the right things were to do. But a godly advisor gave her advice. You need to cast all your bread onto this water because you don't have a second chance of anything. This is your last chance to get any sort of a blessing. And so she listened, and it was to her prophet. People share, and I already talked about that. Okay, uh... So going to him ensured the best results. I talked about this. She made herself attractive. She came when he was happy. She planned for the future wisely. This was her life, right? So plan wisely. This right now, this is your life. So plan wisely. Well, I'll only live five, ten more years. So plan for those after you. Life doesn't stop because your life stops. See what I mean? Do what you can with what you have. And if you're not sure how you should react, then like I said, the godly advice of others. 
So this whole lifting up the thing, what, what's going on here? Well, some commentators think that it is a sexual gesture, that she is exposing his genitals, and that it's some way of maybe tricking him into thinking that they had sex, or, you know, that's no way what the text is talking about. No way. This is actually what it's talking about. It's a custom to, uh, to, to put your, the edges of your garment over someone means that they would fall under your protection. That they would become your responsibility. So what she's asking for is, Boaz, you dummy, you didn't even bother marrying me even though you're my, you're my redeemer. So how about I spell it out very clearly for you. Can you marry me so that I can have some place to live? You know, guys, they're, they're so focused on the task. You know, here's this pretty young thing in his field, and what does he do? Oh, neat. Yeah. Whatever. Uh, <laughs> so this is a symbolic way of asking for marriage. And in that marriage is the idea of protection that Ruth doesn't have a future. So she's abandoning everything she has for the hope of a future. Never forget that. Abandoning everything she had for the hope of a future. Just because you're happy and comfortable and, and living perfectly fine just now doesn't mean things are going to be fine in the future. You understand that? Yeah. Because our happiness in the present time doesn't define how well things will go for us in the future. See what I mean? Mm -hmm. Young kids nowadays, they have this idea of eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. So they rack up credit card debt, they rack up... Uh, school loans and all these different things. Well, I know people who are 50 years old and still paying off debt. I know people who are 70 years old and still paying off debt. Mm -hmm. So what do you do? Do you sit around and guilt trip yourself? No. That's stupid. And nothing can be profited by guilt tripping yourself. See, uh, analyze what you have and take action with what you can do. Mm -hmm. <coughs> don't continue to make the same stupid mistake, but don't wallow in your, in your pity and say, oh, there's no hope for me. Do what you can with what you have. That's, that's, that's the model that we see here. Ruth chapter 3, verses 8 through 18. So here we have Boaz, you know, suddenly wakes up. It happened in the middle of the night that the man was startled and bent forward. And behold, a woman was lying at his feet. He said, who are you? And she answered, I am Ruth, your maid. So spread your covering over your maid, for you are a close relative. Then he said, may you be blessed of the Lord, my daughter. You have shown your last kindness to be better than the first. What was the first kindness? That she stuck with Naomi even though there was nothing to profit her. But what he's saying here is, what you're doing is even, is even a better thing. Why is that? Because Boaz didn't have any children. He didn't have anyone for his inheritance to go through. He was an old man. Doesn't seem like he has, had any close relatives. He, um, Naomi's inheritance would go to somebody else. And Ruth would live the rest of her life with her husband being dishonored because she had no child. So this was far greater than the first thing that she did. See what I mean? Um, for all my people, um, I'm sorry, uh, you have shown your last kindness to be better than the first by not going after young men, whether poor or rich. Now, my daughter, do not fear. I will do for you whatever you ask. For all, all my people in the city know that you are a woman of excellence. Now, it is true I am a close relative. However, there is a relative closer than I am. Now, just so you know, um, Boaz wasn't like a creepy guy who was stalking on her. Israelites were just very conscious of their heritage. And they knew where their family lines were. So he, it's not that he was already thinking about Ruth or asking her or anything like that, um, necessarily. It's that uh, he knew his lineage. Remain, his, uh, remain this night, and when morning comes, if he will redeem you, good, let him redeem you. But if he does not wish to redeem you, then I will redeem you as the Lord lives. Lie down until morning. Uh oh. But in the morning he won't be drunk. Uh oh. Well, hold on. So she lay at his feet until morning and, and rose before one could recognize another. And he said, Let it not be known that the woman came to the threshing floor. Again he said, Give me the cloak that is on you and hold it. So she held it and he measured six measures of barley and laid it, to, and laid it on her. Then she went into the city. Now, there's two reasons why he gave her barley. First off, so that she wouldn't go home empty-handed. Second off, so that it would look like she was not there planning with him. Because he didn't want it to look like they were doing some dishonest scheme. Yeah. See what I mean? So if he sent her home with barley, 
they couldn't have accused him, accused him of anything. Oh, you guys were plotting evil against my family here. I circumnavigated that whole dramatic situation by saying, here, take some barley. When she came to her mother-in-law, she said, how did it go, my daughter? And she told her all that the man had done for her. She said, these six measures of barley he gave to me for he said, do not go to your mother-in-law empty-handed. Now, verse 18, Naomi knows what Ruth is thinking. He's not drunk anymore. Wait, my daughter, until you know how the matter turns out, for the man will not rest until he has settled it today. How did Naomi know that? Because Boaz's character was evident. You can tell a man honor. And what Boaz promised to do, he would carry out. So she didn't, um, the next slide up there on, on, the, on the thing, she didn't settle for what others chased after, the younger, the rich. She didn't, faith doesn't seek after temporary pleasure. Faith sets his eyes on something that's past those things. See, what does Boaz tell her? You've done good in not going after young men, regardless of whether they're rich or poor. See, that's what we chase after, right? Better spouses, more attractive spouses, richer spouses. We, we look for, for sugar daddies. We look for, we look for things that will make our lives more pleasurable, right? I mean, how many husbands can honestly say that they've always been physically content with their wife? I would beg to differ that there's not a single one. Because we're all human. Now, I can't speak for the wives, but I know what goes on in the heart of a man. You marry someone, and it takes about two months after the marriage before you start thinking, I made a huge mistake. And every guy thinks this, they just don't say it. So then, they start setting their eyes on other women. They won't necessarily cheat, they won't necessarily divorce, but it'll come up in their back of their head and they'll just keep thinking about it until they make this decision. I made a commitment to this person. And until you make that decision, you will always have that burning in your heart to go chase after other women because that is what is natural to the flesh. It is natural to the flesh to go seek after however much pleasure you can. Why shouldn't you look at pornography? That's what, our cult, what, the, what my generation is saying. It doesn't hurt anybody. I'm not doing anything. Why shouldn't I look at it? Why should I stay married to somebody? We've fallen out of love. As if love is some kind of a emotion that comes or goes. Love is a choice. Just like faith. It's a choice. See what I mean? And, and, and our culture has it so twisted up about this. But faith is not in temporary pleasure. Faith is in the long term. Faith looks beyond what is now. Yeah, my wife might be getting old and wrinkly, wrinkly and hairy and all kinds of other things too. But guess what? It's a state of humanity. <laughs> and here's the thing. One day your spouse will die, and one day you will die too. And God will not meet you at the pearly gate and say, I understand why you were not faithful to your spouse. Because she was looking nasty. He's not going to say that. He's going to say, I gave you a task to do, and you abandoned it. So you see the difference there. Now, not really. When we meet, when we go to heaven, God will say, "Well done, good and faithful servant." He's not really going to meet us at the gate with you know a list of wrong things. But I just should, trying to show you an, an, an example. Um, anyways, so faith is not focused on temporary pleasures. Boaz wasn't the most likely choice for her to go after. She wasn't. He wasn't the the, the, the closest relative. He wasn't young. He wasn't rich. He was just your average guy, but he was an old dude. There was no reason why, Bo why Ruth should have gone after him. Go after some young thing, you know what I mean? You're young, why not? But Ruth set her faith on something beyond, because what she saw was Boaz was a phenomenal man of good character. He was honorable, and he loved the Lord with all of his heart. And that is more important than any wealth that Boaz ever could have had. See, our strength, our, our good looks, those things all go away. When we're young, we think that we'll live forever. But then as we start aging, we start realizing, holy crap, we're getting old. I don't remember that wrinkle being there. Where did that hair come from? All these bad things start happening to our bodies, and we don't know why, and we can't do anything about it. See, because that's just a natural part of our life. But a person of good character is more important than all those things. So she didn't settle for what others chased after. Boaz was the right man. He had no one to inherit.
and he was God's choice and had proven character. How do you know someone's character by their deeds? This is an older man who had lived his whole life for God. And everybody knew the kind of character. Naomi, who'd been gone 10 years, knew what he was going to do. Why? Because Boaz was a man who loved the Lord and he was going to do what was right. She knew, regardless of whether he was drunk or not. Her faith led to action, which led her to receive a promise. See, Ruth, in throwing all of this and having faith in something beyond herself, received a promise that she was otherwise not entitled to. They avoided any sign of immorality or dishonest scheming by how they went about the issue. It was very, very easy for this to have looked very, very bad. But Boaz completely handled things in such a way where it couldn't even be said that it appeared to be immoral. He handled it in such a way where it didn't even seem to be dishonest. He handled it as honorably as possible. And that's one of the things you see. You see a bunch of characters throughout the book of Ruth who could act dishonest and immoral to get their way. But instead you see people not acting according to their will, but having faith in something bigger than themselves. Naomi, who went back to the land of promise and planned a future for her daughter-in-law. Ruth, who gave up everything for this future. Boaz, who instead of being greedy, invested in somebody else's life. So I mean, like all these people acting in faith instead of for their own personal gain. Don't settle for your desires. Don't settle for your plans. Don't settle for your schemes. But seek God's plan. Because God's plans are far greater than anything you can imagine. Ruth chapter 4, 13. And this is where we're going to stop tonight. So Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife and he went into her. And the Lord enabled her to conceive and she gave birth to a son. Faith goes past here and now. And that's the last point on the slide. That is the last thing I really want to delve into. Faith goes past here and now. She received a new home. She received a new family. She received salvation. She received an inheritance. She received part in Jesus' birth. She was the heir and ancestor of not just King David, but also of Jesus Christ. God responds to our sacrifice. So throw all your worth to God because he's the one who gave you your worth. <coughs> and she inherited a great deal. Faith goes past the here and now. Faith says, this is what God promised me, that's the end of the matter. So then other problems come up. Other things come up. More and more things keep come by. Satan tries to distract us. Oh, well, surely this means that God's promise won't be fulfilled. Finally, this is the death, the death nail into the coffin. No, it's just another thing. It's just a pebble. I know what God has promised. What are you going to do when it seems like everything has gone against that promise that God made to you? Set my eyes on the promise. That is faith. Faith says, I'm not concerned about what happens now. I am assured of what happens then. See the difference? Where is your focus? If your focus is on the here and now, you will always fail. If your focus is on what God said he will do based off of his good character, you will not be disappointed. Faith will only see results through perseverance, submission to God, and correct spiritual focus. So in closing, Ruth always asked if she could. She went to Naomi and said, can I, can I go in, into this field? In chapter 2, she says, Naomi, can I go into this field? Be Boaz gets to his field, and he finds it there. And he says, what's going on here? And, and, and his servant said, this woman came up to us and asked if she could pick her grain here. Did you know that according to the Jewish law, she didn't have to ask? Boaz owed it to the poor of the land. He couldn't withhold it. However, in the land of Israel at this time, people were kind of doing their own thing. And uh, Judges makes that absolutely clear. But anyways, um, she had a good character. She asked and she sought for what was right. Do you know what I mean? God is looking for people who will ask for the blessings. Lord, 
I pray that you would do this. I pray that you'd bring, a, bring about this impossible thing. Because in case you didn't get the memo, you're a Moabite. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You don't deserve the promise. None of us deserve that promise. We are the Moabites. Do you understand what I'm saying? And God is looking for someone who will ask. Oftentimes, we, we're dying in our need. But instead of having faith and turning to God and praying for him to answer us, we sit and wallow and complain about it. Lord, look at how terrible I have it off. Okay, why don't we seek him? Let's take that same energy and seek him instead of complain to him. When your prayer life consists of how much you can complain, it's not much of a prayer life. He asked if, she also asked if Boaz would marry her. See, Ruth had faith. And because of that faith, she asked for what wasn't. God wants us to present our requests to him in faith. Now, what does that mean? It means I'm assured of, of that, that God will bring something. I'm assured that God will answer me. But I'm not God, so I don't know how that's all going to play out. So in the meantime, I'm going to ask. If you'll join me in prayer. Lord, we're, we're asking tonight, Lord. Lord, I pray that you would restore families. Lord, I pray that you would reconcile broken marriages. Lord, I'm praying that you would help us to invest in your kingdom. Lord, I pray that you would raise up workers to the, for the harvest. Lord, I'm praying you would hear us in our need and that you would answer us, Lord. If I could have, uh, if I could have Pastor uh, close this out.